this week on Rockstar Superhero. You probably know Eric Bazilian from the well-known 80s pop group, The Hooters. Eric has played the biggest stages in the world, opening Live Aid in 1985, playing the huge Amnesty International gig in 1986, and even participating in Roger Waters' epic 1990 performance of The Wall at the site of the former Berlin Wall. Eric has just seen it all, man. So, why did Eric end up in Sweden, working with a plethora of different European artists and stepping into a radically different role as a quiet songwriter and producer? Well, there's a story there. Eric's new solo album, Bazillion, is available now and has classic sounding tracks on it. After you listen to this show, I can't exaggerate enough that you should go. You should go now and pick it up. It's a wonderful series of songs and a perfect snapshot of the world we live in, good and bad. This is my conversation with a legend and one of my personal songwriting heroes, Eric Bazillion, on the Rockstar Superhero Podcast. Hey Rob, how you doing? I'm I'm great. Thank you for showing up and smiling. <laughs> hey, that, yeah. So listen. Here's the situation. Okay. As you know, I'm in Stockholm. Yeah. And Stockholm has a challenging weather situation. But yeah. what's happened is we have just gotten our first exquisite day, basically, of the year. So okay. if you don't mind, we're going to go on a little tour of the city while we talk. Is that okay? Oh, that is fantastic. What a gift. Thank you. Cool. And it's okay if I'm in, um, if I'm in vertical mode here? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, it's it's cool. just a man. A chance to talk to you is really, really uh, a, a blessing and a joy for me. I I tend to say that a lot, but I only have people on the show that I really, really deeply want. <laughs> oh, that's that's great, man. Thank you. So I'll take that as a supreme compliment. Yeah, yeah. How, do you expect so? If um, well, you, just in case, if uh, mm -hmm. you drop off, uh. Should I wait like five minutes to see if I can get you back on, or will yeah, I just assume yeah. you're dead? <laughs> no, no, I'm not dead. I got plenty of power here, and um, okay. and the uh, cellular connection in in Sweden overall tends to be pretty amazing. Yeah, so, so, man. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just telling my daughter that I'm going to be walking with her. My, yeah. my wife, my wife went ahead because we were we were all set to go find the find a place to sit down and eat, and I said, oh, I've got this, I've got this interview, and then I realized. I can walk and talk at the same time and chew gum if, I, if necessary. <laughs> yeah, now if you just slap yourself on the stomach and play bass, that'd be great. Uh, oh, no, man. No. Speaking, of, speaking of basses, I just got a new bass. Just yeah. came, came from Italy. Yeah, just I bass. saw some of your stuff on, uh, I think on Instagram, you were posting all the new things that are sort of happening in your life, the people you're jamming with and some of the new instruments. Yeah, well, this, I have this... I got this really crazy, kind of cheesy Italian guitar from the '60s, like in gold flake, and I, I got it about a year and a half ago. And that's mostly what I played on this new album. And yeah. I was I was perusing Reverb um, a couple of weeks ago, and they had the matching bass 1964 Crucinelli at a store in Italy. So I put a bid on it, was accepted, and now I have it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I let's I mean, you're outside now, so we can officially start, right? Or did we just lose you? <laughs> I think we just lost you. <laughs> the greatest Wi-Fi in the history of the world. <laughs> oh, you're coming back. You're coming back. Yes. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I'm just switching from the uh from Wi-Fi to 4G. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah so I so this bass showed up, you know, I, I actually, I was in Slovenia for a couple of weeks and uh, I came back and 
there was the slip and I went to the store and picked it up and it's awesome. It's the cheesiest thing and it's the awesomest thing. Yeah. Man, yeah. I I am so jealous. I see you walking in, in the streets in Sweden and it's and it's the evening and it's bright as bright can be. So so tell me why why Sweden? I'm kind of an expat myself. I my wife is Japanese, so I go to Japan a lot and my goal is to move there soon. However, I haven't made the leap yet. Why did you make the leap to Sweden? Well, a uh, similar situation to you. I married into the faith. And uh, we've been married for 20, 25 years. And, um, we, you know, we've been coming here every summer since, uh, since, ever since 94. Spent a couple full years here. And then in 2017, we just thought, you know, let's, let's do a year. Um, and then we found a great place to, to, to live here. We rented a great place, right? And we're like right in the middle of like the coolest part of town. And then, um, my, uh, we liked it and we stayed another year and then we were kind of going to go back and then COVID happened. So we kind of got stuck yeah. here and, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah. Why go back if you don't have to? I mean, there well, are obviously there's, there's gifts on both sides, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I really, really miss home right now. I'm, I'm ready to go back and probably in the, in the late summer or early fall, we, we will, we're probably, we're probably looking at a two state solution. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. We, we still have our house. We've we rented out our house the past few years and my studio's there. I have access to the studio when I go back. But um, gotcha. I'm ready. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to get everything back. Yeah, no, I, so, I understand that. It, now, is that in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Cool. Yep. I, uh, I, I, I don't know what it's like. I mean, I've been to Pennsylvania and I haven't been to Sweden, <laughs> yeah. but, but what's it like growing up in Pennsylvania? If you don't mind, maybe give, give me a little bit of your back history because Wikipedia isn't going to tell me what I need to know. Okay. Well, it's, I mean, the facts are all there. Yeah. Yeah. I was born, you know, I was born in Philadelphia, grew up in the city. Um, I mean, you know, not in the city, city, but within the city limits anyway. Sure. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, Philly's an interesting place. It's sort of in the, sort of a second class citizen because we're in the shadow of New York. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like in, in the, like in the early days of the band, we, um, we couldn't get anyone from, from New York, from the record companies to come down to see us. Wow. Which was a fairly common thing. You know, if we, if we'd been from Athens, Georgia, they would have come. Yeah. You know, or, you know, and they did. exotic. Yeah, they sure did. But you know, Philadelphia was like, nah, you come here and play. So, you know, instead of seeing us playing for 500 fans in a packed house, we'd go up there and play for 30 people and they'd say, Oh, you, you didn't move the room. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting that you said that though, because that's how I hear the Hooters, when I, when I think back or when I listen back to that material, I hear a combination between new wave and what I call college rock, right? Which is the early, early REM type thing mm -hmm. with the, uh, you know, acoustic instruments, the mandolin, you know, a melodica, things like that. Um, was that, was that your feeling too, that you kind of, I mean, obviously you had your own voice, but do you feel like you were a mixture of the different styles? Um, no. <laughs> no, I really, you know, we really, we really followed the beat of our own drum. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was, there was a bit of a, there was a bit of a path creatively. You know, we started out as a reggae and ska band. Right. For the first few years. And, and that was sort of a reaction to the, the few years we'd spent before that as Baby Grand, where we were, you know, hoping to get paid by the note. You yeah. know, very, uh, you know, technically musically speaking far more advanced um pushing the envelope we were kind of like steely dan on steroids yes and uh, and you know we did that for a while and it went as far as it could go and then at some point we thought you know let's do something people can dance to and that was when the ska thing was ha you know had just hit the u.s and we thought there are no american bands doing this right so why not us yeah, yeah. You added an artistic element to the the new wave thing to me. You you took the bounce out of it and you gave it this organic feeling 
that nobody had heard before. I think that's, you know, for me, what, why you popped was that you had, you had traditional music that was meeting modern culture. Yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, again, we, we were just doing what we did. It wasn't really calculated in any way yeah. whatsoever. And then, and then have, you know, having the, the traditional instruments and it was just sort of our way of having fun. You know, first, first the melodica came and that was sort of inspired by Augustus Pablo in, in the reggae world. And then somebody had a mandolin, I picked it up and like, hey, this is cool, let's, let's use this. Yeah, well, and it wasn't common to hear, you know, dual sort of lead vocals, if you will. I mean, right. obviously there were some songs where Rob was singing only, or maybe you would jump in later, but you had a lot of unison parts and yep. your, your voices have this same, you know, that very similar timbre. So they made a lot of sense together. And in fact, yeah. even recently, I was like, which which part is Eric singing? You know, are you singing the higher harmony or the lower? Because it was it, it seemed impossible to tell. Uh, you know, it's funny. We when we sing together, we sound very similar. When we sing separately, it it's very pretty different. different. I think, and and it's funny because sometimes we switch parts. You know, if Rob's not feeling up to the high part, I'll take over, or vice versa. Um, you know, it's a, it's it, we call it the univoim. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but that's what we call it. When you know, when we get when we get that that resonant thing, you know, the John Paul thing. Um, yeah. It's it's funny. I got I got a message on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago from Gunnar Nelson. Oh remember, my remember God! The, remember the band yeah. Nelson? Yeah, out Robin Gunnar. Yeah, and um, yeah. he out of nowhere he just he said. Man, you know, we were really inspired by you guys for the the, the, the dual lead vocal thing. Like, cool. That then is I, awesome. Then I, you know, I had to tell him that that their father was actually my first rock star idol before the Beatles. Wow, wow, that's so great. I liked Ricky too. I thought he was pretty great, but I I I jumped into him a little later when you know when he was releasing best of hits stuff on KTEL. Yeah, right. Do you remember yeah, those commercials? I, <laughs> sure, sure. But, you know, I was watching. I was watching Ozzy and Harriet every week when I was, you know, seven, eight years old. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, you mentioned uh, Lennon McCartney a little bit a while ago, uh, and I know, like almost every musician in the world, there was a huge influence there. The, you know, I see them on the Ed Sullivan Show, or I've heard them, and I say, "Wow, I wanna, I wanna do that." Right. Sure. Did you see your? relationship with Rob, very Lennon McCartney, you know, maybe fighting over songs or, you know, or, or, or a, attribution going to the wrong party all the time, because it, it seems to me that you guys, as the Hooters, at least were very much, it was you two and then the other guys. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, it, it still is. Um, yeah. But, you know, you know, it's a somewhat different path because, you know, Lennon McCartney, by the time they got to a hard day's night, they were writing separately. Yeah, yeah. And with Rob and I, for the most part, it's, it's de definitely for all of the earlier stuff, we wrote all of those songs head to head. Yeah. It was very rare that one of us would come in and say, I've got a song. Okay. You know, we would start from scratch and, and finish together, you know. And I mean, in later years, we, you know, our, our more recent and less known repertoire, you know, there are songs that I brought in or he brought in. Yeah, yeah. How, how did you how did you figure out who was going to sing or who was going to play what instrument? You know, how how did you figure that out? Well, the, the singing thing just sort of whoever felt like singing it, you know, whoever grabbed it first. Um, you know, we always had our our MO was that we both always had to feel like we were singing even if we weren't. Right, and when you and when you really got this to the you know to the real hooterized sound, it was the two of us singing together. You know, yeah. and we and we danced. He sings the first two lines of the of the first verse, and then and then I come in, and then we sing the choruses together. I sing the first two lines of the second verse, then he comes in. So it's really a vocal ensemble sound, even if even if one of us is singing at any particular point. And as far as the instruments go, that was very clear. He played the keyboards, and I played all everything else. Yeah, yeah, you did play everything else. <laughs> I did, yeah. You also seem to be sort of the de facto uh, on stage leader. You know, I mean, I remember watching Live Aid specifically, and and saying, "Wow, that guy's 
he's the boss. Like it felt like you were driving the band. Is that is that kind of how it worked on stage? Um, yeah, you know, well, Rob's stuck behind the keyboard for the most sure. part. He he loves it when he gets to strap on the accordion and, and you know run run across the stage. So yeah. um, I'm I'm kind of up there emoting for both of us. <laughs> you know, I mean, Rob does his cheerleading. He likes to point and and you know do all that stuff that that keyboard players like to do you know I, 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 i've, I've kind of got my hands both my hands occupied all the time yeah yeah um but uh you know it's we we have our dynamic you know we have our thing and it, i i wouldn't say that it's ever been competitive i you know it's i think we push we push each other and ourselves um i mean i'm not saying that there that there haven't been more episodes you know frictions but that's you know that's what bands do. That's what families do. Yeah. No, it sounds like you have a beautiful relationship. I was talking with Graham Russell uh, from Air Supply, and he was talking about how he and Russell's relationship was one of the most intimate brotherhood, that they, they just never argued. They really did see eye to eye, and they understood each other's strengths, and they never, ever brought up each other's weaknesses. So they could stay well together. Yeah, it sounds I, like you have the same sort of relationship with Rob. I mean, listen, we've had some blow-ups. Sure. We've we've had some epic blow-ups, but I mean, you know, I say this sort of half jokingly, but we've lo we've known each other so long, we like each other again. <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, one of the things artists tend to have is a lot of anxiety. I, I don't know what it is, but we all tend to have a little bit, at least, it's, whether it's how we feel about ourselves or how much we want somebody to love what we do. And I, and I thought about the fact that you did the Live Aid gig and you were the first ones out of the gate. And then you did, you know, the big Amnesty International thing. And then you did, I think you did the wall, didn't you? With, didn't you yep. support Sinead O'Connor during the, during the mother? Yeah, we were on stage with Sinead. Um, we, um, and we, we actually did a whole set before the wall, before the oh, wall. Oh, wow. Concert. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't know that. We were between the Hawks, Ronnie Hawkins and the Hawks, and uh, and the Chieftains. Oh my God! Yep. Wow. So okay, so this definitely plays into that. You're literally talking between the three shows. You're talking over a million people. Yeah. Yep. Easily. And if, you, and if you count, you know, uh, on uh, the TV audience, you're talking over a billion. Yeah. Right. How does that play into your stomach? Because because I would poop on stage if that happened to me, and I'm an established musician. You know, I know how it, I know how to play under pressure. But my God, well, you know, Live Aid was a blur. We were on stage for ten minutes. Yeah, and it just, you know, there, we didn't have time to get nervous. Yeah, we just, yeah. and you know, and the fact that it was our hometown, and we felt like we belonged there. Nice. You know, nice. it wasn't like, you know, you know, we, I didn't feel like we were out of our league. Yeah. Well, it's because you weren't. No. Well, okay. Yeah. I guess. I, guess we <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's a reason you were on the radio. You wrote yeah. great songs that everybody loved. I mean, everybody loved them. People who weren't listening to, you know, your type of music were still attracted to it. And, you know, even preparing for this interview, you know, I went back and listened to some of the old Hooter stuff. And, you know, I hadn't listened to that album, that first album in, I don't know, 15 years at least. I mean, you hear it on the radio, but I mean, I hadn't listened to the album. And, yeah. you know, when And We Dance comes on and I'm laying in bed last night. And we dance, I believe. And I mean, it's, it's, it's the best kind of earworm. So there's a reason you're here, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I'll own that. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, because of your current experience in Europe, and the fact that you've been there for a few years, and you know, even though you're homesick, it seems to me that European music, European musicians, European audiences are somehow more, it sounds unfair, but mature. It's like they're open to new things. They're open to new styles. They're open to creativity where in America, and I'm not going to slam any particular artist, but we tend to listen to sort of two genres of music, rap or you know, very, very um, big, loud pop. We don't really have a big appetite for anything challenging. What's What's your experience been like as a songwriter in Sweden? I mean, I've, I've heard the new album and we'll, and we'll talk about that, but 
you know, what are you, do you track the same way as far as your feelings about European audience culture? Um, I mean, the biggest difference that I can see is just how faithful our audience in Germany has been. You know, we, Nervous Night sold 2 million copies in the U.S. Wow. Um, and, and, um, and now outside of Philadelphia, you know, we've got, you know, the fans who follow us and social media and comment, but really we couldn't get, we couldn't go on tour and get arrested in the, in the U.S. outside of Philadelphia. That's um, awful. You know, every year we, we, we've been playing at uh, the, the International Food and Wine Festival at Epcot Center every year. And that's because the guy that books it went to Temple University in Philadelphia. There, <laughs> oh there's always God. a Philly connection. But, you know, otherwise, you know, we're, we're old news in the U.S., but, you know, Germany is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. And yeah. it's not just us. You know, I, I, you know, we'll be on tour in Germany. I'll see a poster for some, some artist that I haven't heard of in, in 20 years. And where are they now? They're in Germany. Yeah. You know, that's, that's an awesome point. Um, I talked to Susie Quattro about two months ago. And she has, as you know, zero influence in the States. Outside of Happy Days back in the 70s, nobody knows, nobody cares. Right. It's a bummer, but it's kind of how it works. And yet she's huge in Australia and Germany. Huge. Yep. Still yep. sells out every place she goes. Yep. Wow. Um, well, I'm sorry because you guys do deserve more than that, but at least you have that radio play that continues on into infinity right we are so grateful to have what we have yeah uh, you yeah know, i mean you know every summer well, except for last summer and this summer now unfortunately you know we get to go to germany and be rock stars for a month or two yeah yeah you know, no, that's, we get, that's great we you know we fly over we get on the bus we go to our first sound check everything works because we've got a great road crew and, you know, the biggest decision we have to make every day is um, what am I having for dinner? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you do you self-manage and self-produce then or, or do you still or do you still have support, you know, traditional label support, that sort of thing? Uh, we have we have a promoter in Germany. Gotcha. That's, gotcha. that's what we have. Yeah. You know, when we do release music, we release it ourselves when you know, yeah, we are we are on our own. We're, we're yeah. all grown up. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask you a question about one of us before we talk about the new album? You ask all you want. That's probably okay. the most interesting story I've got. Well, I mean, I, I, I've actually read bits and pieces of it. I've mm -hmm. watched a video of you talking with your wife about it a bit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the problem with doing research on an artist is you've seen the story, but the rest of the people don't necessarily know. So uh, do you mind sharing that? Because it's a beautiful story and I love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go all the way back. Um, uh, July of 1993, we got on a plane to fly to the very north of Sweden to do a festival. And wow. uh, uh, a beautiful Swedish, young Swedish woman sat down next to me and we started talking. And when we got off the plane, we exchanged phone numbers. A few months later, I was back in, in Stockholm and it became apparent that there was a, perhaps a future for us. Uh, that January, I was planning on spending four months in Philadelphia to do the Joan Osborne record with Rob and Rick Chertoff, and I suggested that she come over and stay with me for those four months and see how it went rather than transatlantic dating. <laughs> yeah. um, so she'd been there for about a week, and um, uh, coincidentally, one, one day, one of our sessions, I picked up Rob's guitar and started playing the guitar riff which I played all day. Uh, Sarah came and picked me up uh, that evening. We went home, had dinner, watched the making of Sgt. Pepper, in which wow. George Martin's, you know, in front of that four, that four tra channel red console. She yeah. said, what's this about four track recording? I had a Porta studio, four track cassette recorder, record something she said. And I said, I'll make up a little, a little track. I've got this guitar riff and I had a little drum machine and sampler and, made a little arrangement and recorded it and she said that's great now sing it and i hit record and that's what came out those words came out just yeah, automatically the, there's no way there's no way i could have planned those words no that's no, there's no way that that literally 
literally, I, I think I punched in the choruses. I think I, I think I got the verses on the first pass and then second pass the choruses. Then I got stuck for a last line and uh, Sarah had fallen asleep and she woke up and said, trying to get home. And I'm like, trying to get home, trying to make, trying to make his way home. Thank you. Oh my God. Yep. So did your wife to be know you were, uh, you know, I, when she first met you, yep. did she know it, who you were at that time? No idea. No idea. Wow. No idea. Her, I her love brother this. did. Her brother did. He was very enthusiastic. Yeah. About yeah. It, which was, I mean, it was great that she didn't uh, uh, actually, you know, we yeah, met on equal footing. And, uh, but then, you know, the second time we met, she came to our show in, in Stockholm. Yeah, and, got, and then got said, "Oh my God, I know these songs." <laughs> yeah, well, that's a that's a common thing, you know. A lot of people don't. A lot more people know the music than than know the band. Yeah, yeah, I I love that song. And now, when it came out, because of American Radio Play, I got sick of it really fast, right? Sure. Because it was it was on the radio all the time. So it has to be sort of your personal biggest hit in 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 that way. Is that is that true? That you're absolutely. your biggest sort of listener. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, aside from you know the, just the rewards that I get from it, um, the material re rewards. It's my biggest song in terms of it's. It's the most complete expression of my worldview. Yeah. You know, like like Austin Powers going, "This is me in a nutshell." How did I get in yeah. a nutshell? Yeah, I love the questioning of the lyrics. The fact that those poured out of you is startling because. I mean, I have for years equated the song with the movie Last Temptation of Christ. Wow. Um, okay. I Really, yeah. I, I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, but that's how I see it. Because mm -hmm. to me, I love that movie. I love, love, love that movie because it, it gave us a snapshot into what, I mean, I would like to think that Jesus was an awful lot like the guy in that movie, you know, that he was concerned and questioned and wasn't sure if he was crazy or, or whatever was going on. Right. I'm yeah. not even talking about religion. I'm just talking about like the, the life of, of this guy. You and Brian, the life of Brian. <laughs> yes. The life of Brian. And, and well, you know, I mean, you, the song has those questions. I mean, does God poop? You know what I mean? I know you're not asking that, but you know, I love the humanity of it because it ties us closer and it allows us to question that hole in our heart. I mean, that, because that's how I feel about it. It's well put. It's very well put. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, this, it's, you know, b believe me, I've gotten tons of, of emails and, you know, letters before email was ubiquitous from people of all faiths, you know, or non faiths thinking that, you know, well, you must be one of us, pun not intended. You know, you must be a Christian. You must be a this. You must be a that. And, yeah. And, you know, whatever whatever you want to think that's fine yeah. yeah yeah it's interesting too that you say that because um you don't know this but i'm a i'm a percussionist i'm a drummer i've been playing my whole life and so me as a musician i'm listening to the rhythms i'm listening to the subtext i'm listening to the arrangement i'm almost never ever listening to the lyrics and Back in your Hooters, the early Hooters days, and you did all you all, all you know all the zombies, and and you know have the Holy Moses and the Pharaohs, and you have these you know um, Old Testament you know Pentateuch expressions, and then you had you know one of us, and I was like, I don't understand Eric's religious perspective, but but all I could think of was yeah that you must be some. Uh, very loud, devout, something Jewish or or Catholic or something, because there was all these religious expressions, and of course, neither of those things are really true. <laughs> yeah, honestly, you know that I don't know where they come from. You know, I, sometimes I just say they're 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 archetypes of our civilization. Sure, sure. That, you know that 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 pop into my into my stories because I'm telling human stories. Yeah, uh, um, you know, uh, but uh, no, it's 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 interesting because I do, I've made some really great connections with with you know with with Christian leaders, Jewish, you know, the the the, the Lubavitchers love me, the Hasidim, mm. you know, because I'm Jewish by yeah. by birth and and by you know experience. Although like you know most, I after my bar mitzvah, I I took the money, brought my Rickenbacker twelve string, <laughs> and ran. 
<laughs> yeah, I can see that happening. <laughs> but, but, it, but, but you know what? It keeps coming back to me, and and you know, I, I have an affection for it. I have an affection for 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 any tradition that that promotes humanity and, and evolution yeah. and, and and awakening. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you seem like a really nice guy. So I imagine like most <laughs> nice guys, we're not really down on just slamming people because we don't necessarily follow their particular bent, right? It, right. It's, it's, it's not an offense, you know? Yeah. Um, I love or I have a fascination with etymology. And mm -hmm. I don't know what your last name means, but I'm hoping you'll tell me. Um, yeah. However, Eric... Uh, it's, it's typically thought of as a ruler or a mighty one, you know, a sort of a singular type person like Alexander is another powerful name. Right. Um, but Eric is Germanic and I'm wondering how you ended up to be named Eric, if your parents ever shared this with you. And two, if you've ever thought about the fact that your name literally means who you are, because <laughs> you are a leader, you are in a sense, right? You are that front man, you are mighty. And regardless of its Hebrew intentions, right, those, those, you know, the names in the Bible, they mean something, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious what your takeaway is on that. Well, my great grandfather's name was Elik. And um, so it was either going to be Alex or Eric, and I'm glad it was Eric. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to me, too, that you said Alex and I brought up Alexander because, yep, yep. you know, so so you were supposed to be a leader for whatever right. reason, defined, you know, just created. You're a leader. Wait, can you, one second. I just have to ask my daughter something. No worries. Oh, is mom up there? Yeah. Okay, I'll walk. I'll come up with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm walking now. I'm, good, good. Well, yeah. let's talk about the new record. I know we're limited yep. on time and I want to let you have some beauty. Um, well, don't you want to? Don't you want to hear about the last name? The last name's got a great story. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Please, the Bazillion, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my my grandfather, Louis Louis Chris Bazillion, came was a, a Lithuanian Jew who oh. came to the U.S. in 1912, and we always wondered about the name, and nobody really knew because um, you know most all Lithuanian Jews have Russian or Polish names. Um, oh. It's not a Lithuanian name. And then I, I had a taxi driver, a Turkish taxi driver from Stockholm a couple of years ago, who saw my credit card. And he said, what is this name, Bazillion? And I told him the story. Yeah, we don't really know. And he said, you are Khazar. I'm what? You are Khazar. Look up. Use the Google machine. So I used the Google machine. And apparently, I didn't know this, but in like 752, the ruling class of the Khazar Empire, which was between Iran and Turkey, Converted to Judaism. I don't wow. know who in their right mind converts to Judaism unless they're married. <laughs> but Especially in the for, Middle East. <laughs> so for whatever reason, they did. And then apparently they emigrated to Lithuania like 100 years later. Wow. And there's actually a theory. It's called the Khazar theory of Jewish ancestry, of Ashkenazi ancestry, which says that all of the Ashkenazi Jews are descended from the Khazars who emigrated. Wow. So you so, and Mark Marin are cousins. Yeah. There's, yeah, I have no idea. But, you know, the theory's also been debunked many times, so we have no idea what, what's really going on. But it's my story, and I'm sticking to it. It's a good Yeah. Point. No. Well, you've worked with so many artists, you know, over the years. You know, Cindy Lauper and Patti Smythe and Leanne Rimes and Ronnie Spector and John Bon Jovi and all these people. Um, do you see the better parts of yourself in the role as a producer and as a songwriter, or do you prefer to be out front and be the, you know, the guy who everybody's watching? Uh, both. I, I really oh. need both. You know, if, if, if I get stuck in one for too long, I, I, I get stale. So, um, um, yeah, both. And you know, that's my, that's my intent. That's my goal. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, my contact with an audience obviously is more direct when I'm on stage. Um, some, I, get, I almost get into the shamanistic state when, when I'm doing that. I really feel like, you know, I should be, I should be blowing sacred smoke at people when I'm on stage, healing them. Um, but I, you know, I get a bit of that when I'm in the role of producer and, and, and songwriter as well. I'm just telling yeah. a story. 
I'm just trying to, you know, I'm trying to spread the truth, whatever that is. Whoever's yeah. listening. Yeah. No, that's, that's an awesome. I mean, at least you're telling the truth the whole time. Yeah. I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it's different. You know, working with different artists, you get into different, different mind, different headspace because you're, you know, when when I'm working with an artist, I've got to get inside their head. I'm telling, I'm helping them tell their story. Yeah. You know, rather than yeah. rather than telling mine or finding the place where my story intersects with theirs. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then even as a, you know, as a solo artist, I'm trying to tell everyone's story. I'm trying to find a place where my story intersects with everyone's, which is really what, what this album of mine was about. Because it's very personal. It's the most personal stuff I've done. But at the yeah. same time, I'm trying to find where it resonates with the world at large because we're all kind of resonating with something these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, I listened, I listened to it. And I love the track back in the 80s. Yeah, everybody um, does. Everybody does. Well, there's a reason. It's a great song. But you know what it, what it is, Eric, is it's, it takes us back to a time when everybody we loved was probably still alive, right? There's so much melancholy and, and bittersweetness, but there's also this pursuit of possibility. And, you know, these days, the world is, such, is so upside down. It, it doesn't feel like there's much hope. And so I think we long for a time you know, when, when the world was in front of us and it was still lovely and, and, and the people we loved were still around. Right, so it, right. it just, that's, it takes me there, you know. And the thing is, in the future, we're going to look back on this time, as challenging as this time has been, yeah. we're going to look back on this. And, you know, I really miss that pandemic. I really yeah. miss the time when we were forced to, when we couldn't, when we could, you know, it's a, um, it's a, uh, it's you know when I turned what was when I think when I turned forty you know oh my God I'm turning forty how can I be turning forty yeah um, and I, I was having a conversation with someone and they said you know what in in twenty years when we turn sixty we're gonna look at ourselves at forty and it's like damn we looked great when we were forty <laughs> absolutely and then you know what when we turn 80 we're going to look at ourselves when we were 60 and we're going to say damn we looked great when we were 60. yeah so you know it's it's really not a song about nostalgia it's a song about appreciating the moment you know living in the moment and, and getting breathing in all the good air there is yeah my dad said that um right before he passed away he said you watch out rob he said because Day before yesterday, I was in high school. Yesterday, I was getting married to your mom, and today I'm dying. Oh man! Oh, dude. Yeah, yeah. Very, very hard. Um, two final things I'd like to ask you: mm -hmm. um, Are you content? Did you do everything you set out to do? Yes, I did, and no, I'm not. Okay. Um, <laughs> No, if I was content, I'd go out, I, you know, I'd go, go live on a beach and, or play golf. Uh, no, I, I feel like I'm just getting started. You know, I've thought at, at times, maybe, you know, maybe I need to reinvent myself, you know, like artists do. But I'm still working on the first version. I, yeah. I still, I don't feel like I've completely gotten it right. You know, I mean, yes, that you know, the Hooters stuff is is great. One of us is, you know, transcendent song that everybody I know wishes they'd written. Yeah. But you know, I still like I've 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 got a whole lot of fight left in me. Yeah. Okay. Got a lot, so then, a lot more oh, love good. to share. A lot more love to share. If I'm, well, know. clearly, and you're super nice, and you gave me so much time today, and that's so gracious, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, so then I have to ask this final question then. So, so then because you haven't necessarily hit all the, you know, the things you wanted to hit, have you, are you learning how to make peace with that and let go of what you haven't? Um, sometimes, but I'm not giving up trying. Yeah. 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 Yep. I mean, oh, I, I have, you know, I'm making peace with the fact that the world isn't what it was and, and that, you know, I've, you know, a million songs are uploaded to, to the streaming services every week. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm probably never going to have the kind of ubiquitous, I've made the whole world sing along at the same time thing, but who is, nobody is now. Yeah. 
But you, you know, could have they, said that before you wrote one of us and you did wrote, you wrote one of us. It, it never ends, man. It's still in yeah. you. There's more, so much more in you. Sure. But you know, but the, the chances of it becoming a ubiquitous song sure. like that are, I mean, you know, think about this, the songs that are huge right now, who's going to remember them in five years? What are wedding bands going to be playing in 20 years? Are they going to be well, playing WAP? I don't think so. I yeah. hope not. <laughs> but you know, Rich, Richard Farnsworth, the actor, got nominated for an Oscar a year before he died, and I believe he was seventy-eight years old. So it's never too late, my friend. Yeah, um, um, you know what? It's not. It's not. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to party like it's nineteen sixty-nine. Nice, nice. <laughs> Well, I'm going to make sure everybody knows about the new album. I'm going to get them to Eric Bazilian. You know what I mean? I I, 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 I love what I'm hearing. I hope I hope we can stay in touch, but I promise to do everything in my power to, to keep that flame alive for you. And I appreciate you so much, Eric. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Likewise, man. Thank you so much. It's great talking yeah. to you. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now.